This video is about linear model evaluation, specifically model assumptions. Looking at the machine learning process, today's topic falls into the regression subset of supervised learning algorithms and focuses on the evaluation aspect. After fitting a model, we want to evaluate its usefulness. We will consider a few questions when we evaluate a model's use. Does the model satisfy its assumptions? And is the model accurate or does it predict new observations well? This video addresses the first. Does the model satisfy its assumptions? The assumptions play an important part in making inferences, like confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. The standard errors can be over or underestimated when assumptions are violated and can therefore lead to incorrect conclusions. We will first state the assumptions of linear models. Then we will go over each of them in more detail, illustrating how we can check the model assumptions using plotting techniques and suggesting strategies to try to correct violations of model assumptions. Lastly, we will show you how to implement this using R. Equation one is how we write an individual response from a linear model. When using linear models, we assume that the error terms represented by the Greek letter epsilon are independent and follow a normal distribution with mean zero and variance sigma squared. This is written in mathematical notation in equation two. This is really four different assumptions about the error term. Normal distribution, consistent mean of zero, that is no trend in the error, which means linearity in the model, constant variance or spread, which is also called homoscedasticity, and independence. We will examine each of these separately on the next slides, and we'll learn how we can check the model assumptions by looking at plots of the residuals from our fitted model. First, we examine the normality assumption which says that the error should be normally distributed. Major violations of this assumption can lead to incorrect inferences. We will illustrate checking the model assumptions with the house prices dataset from the Modern Dive Library. This dataset contains house sale prices for King County, which includes Seattle. It includes homes sold between May 2014 and May 2015. This data set was originally obtained from Kegel.com. The plot on the left shows the raw data and a simple linear model that uses square feet of living space to predict sales price. The plots on the right give us, give us two ways to visually check the normality assumption. The first plot is a histogram of the residuals. We can see that the distribution has some observations stretched out far to the right. We refer to this as a right skewed distribution. This is not normal. The second plot is a quantile quantile or QQ plot. The Y axis shows the actual residuals. The X axis shows the corresponding theoretical quantiles of a normal distribution. I will explain this in more detail on the next slide, but for now it suffices to know that when the residuals are normally distributed, they will lie approximately on the line that is shown. We are not concerned with minor breaks from normality, like a bit of variation around the line, but with extreme differences from normality, like what we see in our plot above. Simply put, the residuals that lie far above the line are far larger than we would expect them to be if they came from a normal distribution. We also see this in the right skewness of the histogram. The table above shows a sample of the house price data set that was used to fit the linear model that uses square feet of living to predict sale price. The first column shows the fitted value, price hat, that is the value of, the, of price when we put the actual square footage into the model. The second column is the residual, actual price minus fitted price. The resid rank column is the residual's rank. The smallest is rank one, the largest is rank 15,130 the size of the data set. I have shown the four smallest and three largest residuals. 
The resid percentile column shows approximately the proportion of observations that are less than or equal to that residual. It is computed by dividing the residuals rank by n plus 1, 15,131 in this case. The last column, norm quantile, gives the corresponding quantile of the standard normal distribution based on the residual percentiles. Let's look at the fourth ranked residual as an example. The residual percentile of 0 0.0003 is obtained by dividing 4 by 15,131. Then the standard normal quantile is the value on the standard normal distribution where the probability of being less than, than that value is 0 0.0003. That value is negative 3.47. If the residuals follow a normal distribution, they should have a straight line relationship with their corresponding normal quantiles. We've plotted the residuals from the regression of square feet of living on price again on, in the plot on the top right using these manual calculations. And once again, we can clearly see that this is not a straight line relationship. The plot on the bottom right shows an example with normally distributed res residuals. This is what the QQ plot would look like if there were no violations of the normality assumption. Violations of the normality assumption can often be fixed by transforming the response variable, with the log transformation being the, the most common. The assumption of the mean of the residuals always being zero also means that the Ys are a linear combination of the predictors, the Xs. We will often see violations of this assumption when the true relationship between the predictor and response is a curve of some sort rather than linear. Violations of this assumption can lead to inaccurate predictions. We can look at plots of residuals versus fitted values to check this model assumption. The plot on the left shows once, it, once again shows the raw data and a simple linear model that uses square feet of living space to predict sales, sale price. The plot in the upper right corner shows the residuals versus fitted values for this model. We see that on average, the smallest and largest fitted values are greater than zero, meaning these values are being underestimated by the model. The residuals in the model are on average below zero. The residuals in the middle are on average below zero, which means they are being overestimated. This pattern is further reflected in the smooth blue line shown on the graph. This curve shape is common in residual plots where there is a violation of the mean zero assumption. When there is no violation of the mean zero assumption, the plot should be similar to the one in the lower right, where the points are evenly scattered above and below zero throughout the entire plot. Violations of the mean zero assumption can often be fixed by transforming the predictor variable or variables. In simple cases, adding one or two higher level polynomial terms may fix the problem. The constant variance assumption, also called homoscedasticity, means that the residuals should always have the same variance or be similarly spread around. Violations of this assumption can lead to incorrect inferences. We can look for evidence of non-constant variance by once again examining the plot of residuals versus fitted values. That plot is shown in the upper right-hand corner for the model that uses square footage to predict price of houses in King County. A scattered plot of the raw data is shown on the left as a reminder. Notice in the residual plot, the smaller fitted values have residuals that are spread fairly tightly around the horizontal line at zero. The residuals get more and more spread out for larger fitted values. This means the variance and standard deviation of the residuals is increasing as the fitted values get larger. This megaphone-like shape in the residual plot is a telltale sign of non-constant variance. The residual plot in the bottom right shows a, re shows a plot with, non with constant variance. Notice the points have the same amount of spread around zero throughout. Violations of the non-constant variance assumption can often be fixed by transforming the response variable. A log transformation is a common one. When there is a violation of the independence assumption, that means there is some underlying correlation structure in the errors that needs to be accounted for. 
Although there are plots that can be used to check for certain types of correlation, they require you to know something about the underlying structure. So we will just be cognizant of when we might run into these scenarios. Here are some common types of data that would often have cor correlated errors. Longitudinal data, when we collect data on the same subjects or observations over time. Spatial data, where data from certain areas have similar responses. And nested data, like students within classrooms or patients within clinics. This table summarizes the four linear model assumptions we discussed. How to check if the assumptions are satisfied, problems that might occur if they are violated, and suggestions for how you might fix the problem. Before moving on to showing how to implement this in R, I will discuss two other checks that are useful when building linear models. Correlation among, among predictor variables can lead to useful predictors appearing insignificant and vice versa. So we want to be careful about using highly correlated variables in linear regression. One way we can examine this is through a matrix of pairwise plots. The ggPairs function from the ggalley library can help us do this. Note that with large data sets, this can take quite a while to run. Here we notice that square feet of living and square feet of living 15 have a correlation of 0.76, which is quite high. When there are many variables and the data set is large, the ggPairs function can be slow. The correlation matrix plot in the upper left created from the core plot function in the core plot library visually shows the correlations between variables. One downside is this plot can only be used with numeric variables. Variables that have zero variance have the same value for all observations. Zero variance variables will never be useful in a model. Near zero variance variables can also be problematic. These are variables with very little variation. For example, the variable view from the house train data set indicates on a scale of zero to four how good the view is. 13,653 out of 15,130 data points have a rating of zero. The table on the right shows statistics for three variables that were flagged as near zero variance, including view. The freak ratio gives the ratio of frequencies for the most common value over the second most common value. The percent unique is the number of unique values for that variable divided by the total number of observations time one, times 100. So for view, there are only five unique values. If the frequency ratio is large, the default is larger than 19 and the percent unique is smaller than 10%, then the variable is flagged as a potential near zero variance variable. You may want to completely remove the variable or potentially categorize it. You'll definitely want to investigate it further. Before I jump into the details of how to check linear model assumptions using R, I want to remind you of the modeling process that I showed in the previous video. Specifically, I want to call your attention to the special portion of the data that we refer to as the test data. Remember, we save this portion until the very end when we want to evaluate the best candidate models to make a final decision about which one we will use. So we need to split the data into a training and test data set before we begin building models and checking model assumptions. Now let's get into the details of the R code. The first set of code is where we load all the libraries that will be used throughout this video. You should always have this chunk of code at the top of your R Markdown file. If you find you need to use a library in the middle of your code, add it to the libraries at the top, not in the middle of your code. I also set the theme to minimal for my ggplot output. This is a personal preference. The second set of code loads the data, which is from the Modern Dive Library. Then we set a seed so that the splitting that is done after that is reproducible. The house train data set is what we will use to train our models. For now, just a simple linear regression model and to check the model assumptions. The third set of code fits the model 
and prints the model output. I use the tidy function from the broom library to do this instead of the summary function some of you might be used to. This function puts the output in a tibble, a nice data set, so we can easily access whatever we want from it. The augment function from the broom package allows us to access information about the observations after the model was applied. This includes residuals, dot resid, and fitted values, dot fitted. The first five observations are shown in the table on the left. There are other columns of data that I have omitted since we will not use them now. The second set of code shows how we can use the augmented data from the model to plot the fitted line. This is a nice way to plot the fitted line as it allows flexibility if we end up transforming data. We also use the augment function to obtain the data to create the three plots we use to check model assumptions. From the first two plots, we can see that the residuals are right skewed, which indicates a violation of the normality assumption. Thus, we might want to explore transforming the response variable. The third plot indicates some nonlinearity as the mean is not zero throughout as indicated by an upward curve in the blue smooth line. Thus, we may also want to explore transforming the predictor variable. The third plot also reveals a megaphone shape in the residuals versus fitted values. We see that larger fitted values have more variance than smaller fitted values. This also could be remedied by transforming the response variable. We will practice doing the transformations in an in-class activity. In the next video, we will discuss model evaluation further, specifically trying to answer the questions, is the model accurate? And does it predict new observations well?